right, we're back. This is All Things Legal on Money 105.5, the Wall Street Business Network. This is where curious personal injury attorneys distill topical events into their legal essence. Today is no different. I'm joined by my colleague, Edward Shady. Now, apparently, your in-laws are in town. Correct. Uh, Lucy and Richard, they're going to be heading home. with their. They actually came up with a good friends of theirs, uh, Chris and Frank, who's a former chief of police down in Ontario, and they're heading home today. So you guys have a safe drive, and be careful out there with these new increased roadway speed limits. Yeah, and the, the, sh- the uh, theme of the show is the road less taken, so uh, enjoy your drive. Yeah, take the 101. It's not less taken, but it's gorgeous. Oh, yeah, 101 <laughs> or it's Highway 33. Uh, through the Los Padres Forest, drop you right into Ventura. Uh, that's a beautiful drive, too, especially this time of year with all the wildflowers. There you go. Road less traveled. There we go. Boom. Hey, uh, maybe we can change this from a legal-oriented show to, uh, you know, travelocity. You know, I could do that. Flavor. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, basically, before we took the break, we were talking about uh, the road less taken, road less traveled. Uh, and uh, essentially, in Sacramento, we had a decision a while ago to determine what direction the city wanted to go. Uh, whether or not there's going to be an investment in a downtown arena, which the city council decided was a good idea, uh, ultimately attracted a group uh, led by Vivek Ranadive, who has a background from India and then Silicon Valley, uh, super switched on people, Facebook, Qualcomm, et cetera, forward-thinking individuals uh, out of kind of the Elon Musk uh, mold, which are bringing their innovative ideas to to Sacramento. Uh, We've got uh, a Coons uh, piglet a sculpture going downtown. I just got done going to the Andy Warhol exhibit last weekend. A piglet? Uh, yeah, but it, you know, it's, just, it's cool art, right? So you go and see Andy Warhol. Did you know that the uh, Crocker uh, Museum is the oldest museum west of the Mississippi? That's in Sacramento, right? That I did not know. Yeah, it's very cool. So um, these are t- type of things that I'm enjoying as somebody who's lived in San Francisco Bay Area, who lived in Malibu, who's lived in Seattle, born in Africa, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, just seeing a bit of the world. And this place is absolutely a stunning place to live from a physical, uh, topographical perspective. But also we're getting some cool culture. We've got some really interesting people that are kind of leading a new direction in regards to the investment. And that is the road that we're taking at this point. And in keeping with that theme, uh, there has been an architectural rendering, and you can see it in the Sacramento Bee, uh, of the proposed uh, Sacramento Downtown Rail, Ro- Rail Yard uh, Soccer Stadium. Uh, it looks like it's going to have, I think, about 25,000-seat stadium. Uh, they're going to kind of try to do it a little bit like they do in South America and Argentina, uh, where they'll have uh, the Tower Bridge br- 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 Battalion, their supporters of the soccer team, and uh, they're, it's Sacramento Republic FC. And they uh, basically will have their own uh, beer hall and own concession area, which is kind of cool. This will be standing room only. And it's going to create this kind of feeling of camaraderie and this, this sense of community, which I think is really cool. It, it, it's like, you know, I like watching soccer played in Europe, especially Premier League yeah, and, the exactly. soccer, and the soccer club teams, you know, FC, uh, the football club teams, because the stadiums come right on down to the field. I mean, when you're in the front row, you're four or five feet off. And here, when they try to play soccer in a football stadium, you're 40 feet back. It's just not the same. So if they build a stadium properly and do it like that, I'll be down there. I, I, I love watching soccer from time to time. Yeah, I, I, I had a chance. I did uh, Iron, Iron Man Triathlon in Barcelona last year in October. And uh, with my beautiful girlfriend, Tanya, you speak Spanish. And so you get a general sense about how important soccer is to community. And uh, we were staying at a hotel right next to where uh, Barcelona plays. And... You just get this sense that it, there is a connection that these individuals have for that soccer team, which is essentially embodies their feeling of the city that they're from, Barcelona. And the same thing can happen with Sacramento, right? And, and uh, whatever that is, which I think is interesting, but it's a $226 million investment uh, in a new stadium, which can also be used for outdoor concerts and just kind of adding another avenue of cultural direction that we have an option to attend or not in Sacramento, which I think is pretty cool. Well, yeah, it's just adding another gem to this jewel we call Sacramento. And, and that doesn't happen unless the California Environmental Quality Act with Daryl Steinberg happens. He streamlined it, made infill projects a lot easier to approve. 
Uh, the California Environmental Quality Act, we've discussed this before, it's really not about saving the de- desert tortoise or protecting a, a, a black-throated hummingbird. It, it's not that. It's basically the environmental integrity of the architecture in the area, traffic, noise, etc. It's more of an abatement of nuisance than it is really protecting the environment, but that's what, it, what it's called. And it was streamlined as a result of Daryl Steinberg basically seeing an opportunity for this great investment in downtown Sacramento that happened legally. And then we had the franchise or franchisees issues with, with the NBA because the Maloofs wanted to take the team through Chris Hansen, uh, not the guy on Dateline, but uh, the uh, hedge fund guy from San Francisco wanted to take it up to Seattle. So all this great investment, you can actually go back and thank the Maloofs for trying to sell yeah. the Kings. And it doesn't happen <laughs> unless you blame the lawyers, right, as uh, that was proposed uh, by Shakespeare, uh, because all the legal issues had to fall in the right place. And they did, and now we got this investment. And then, now Kaiser is stepping it up. And they are uh, proposing a 18,000 square foot sports med clinic, medical clinic downtown, right near the arena, which is going to basically help people figure out sports injuries and then come up with a way to cure them. Uh, we just got done having a great lunch with U.S. Cryotherapy, which is in Roseville. And they have one of the only three facilities in California where you can go into a room that is 180 degrees below zero when you walk, walk around for two and a half to three minutes. And the idea is, is that all of the blood will coalesce in the core of your system, removing the blood from the areas that are injured and the, the toxic substances that are coalescing. Let's say you've got a hip injury or a knee injury, et cetera. And then when you come out, all the blood is oxygenated and it goes back to the area that's injured. And that helps, uh, helps healing and also kind of brings endorphins, et cetera, because it's kind of like jumping to Lake Tahoe. Uh, you know, in December for two two minutes. I think of it as like cleaning a sponge, man. You squeeze it, get everything out, let the yep. fresh water in, squeeze it out, and it's got a clean sponge. So people that uh, interact with our office, the doctors that we interact with, that now have the ability to refer out to that facility for those who are re- recovering from injury, which is very similar to what Kaiser's proposing. So it's going to be a more proactive, holistic approach rather than, you know, here's some Norco, you know, take that and thrive, right? It's like, here's, let's identify the problem, get you some therapy, fix your problem rather than mask the symptoms. Uh, we have a major epidemic now, and there's been a lot of legal issues associated with overprescription of Oxycontin, Norco, Vicodin, et cetera, because what that does is trade one problem. We see it in our personal injury practice, trades one problem, which is an injury, and trades it for a drug addiction, which is not cool. And it's not even a trade because it's been masking the underlying injury, so you still have the injury and you get another problem on top of it. So that's the downside. So if you read the sports page, and, and that's the distillation of medical issues to their curative essence because they're not motivated by money, not motivated by legal advantage. They're motivated by Kobe's hurts his shoulder. Let's find out what the problem is and fix it as soon as possible. And you'll notice that athletes get chiropractic, physical therapy, electrical muscle stimulation, massage, hot and cold therapy. They have that done after diagnostic tests are done. So if they have a knee problem, they get an MRI. If they have a bone problem, they get an X-ray. If they have radiating pain, numbness or tingling, they have an MRI. And it's not done because they're suing somebody. They go, they want to know what the problem is before they start therapy to fix it. So this this Kaiser uh, proposal where they're talking about uh, diagnose and treat injuries related to sports and recreational activities, that's awesome. Correct. And yep. that is the best approach. And then this cryotherapy, which I think they may be putting downtown as well. Uh, the Kings already use it. The Lakers use it. Athletes use it. And you know it's got to work because they don't use it unless it's efficacious. They're, 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 they're not motivated by anything other than their health. And so there's U.S. cryotherapy. It's in Roseville. And it's right off of uh, Sierra College Boulevard. Um, really good guys out there. Uh, met with them last week. And I use it because I'm training for another Ironman right now, and it, it helps me heal faster in areas that uh, are, are a bit inflamed. Uh, it's really good uh, for, for, for those problems. But anyway, they're having uh, their five-year anniversary this weekend, and I, there's going to be a barbecue out there. And I think all the treatments are free. Nice. Uh, on Saturdays, you have a chance to go check it out and, and see. And so, if, you know, if you're an athlete or you just have, you know, some uh, nagging pain, knee or joint, et cetera, or just want to experience a really interesting uh, – moment in time whereby your endorphins will, will start rushing right afterwards because it's really it's really cold uh and you get to listen to some good music while you're in there and well since you started this show out with some literature before you go down you should reject london's to build a fire yeah. <laughs> you have yeah. all the appreciation in the world with regard to the cold <laughs> so we've got the major league soccer stadium happening we got kaiser doing investment that is the road less Tra- taken or less traveled and we're traveling it now right on i for one who is a transplant to Sacramento now for now about 21 years, the changes that I'm seeing in Sacramento I think are great ones. And not everybody agrees with it. Some people have a different perspective. 
Uh, but downtown Sacramento's got some of the oldest buildings in California, um, older than most of, uh, of San Francisco because most of San Francisco burned down in, it was 1906 uh, as a result of the earthquake. So Sacramento has these beautiful Victorian buildings. It's, it's unbelievably pedestrian friendly because that's flat. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the great restaurants now. We've got, you know, the Crocker Art Museum. And then you're walking by these beautiful Victorian buildings. And now all this extra investment with some great people directing it who are switched on individuals from Silicon Valley with some forward-thinking ideas. Um, I'm very happy to be living here. So Robert Frost's theme is applying to that. All right, let's go ahead and talk about uh, traveling now. Uh Uh-oh. And and we were talking about the judge refusing to block a passport flag for sex crimes. So basically what happened was is that an international Megan's Law uh, that President Barack Obama signed in February requires that other countries are notified that uh, registered sex offenders are traveling to their country. So there's a proposal to put on new passports a mark. A, uh, well, they haven't determined what the mark would be. A so, scarlet letter, so to speak. Yeah, yeah exactly. So uh, what's his, what's the guy's name from uh, the subway spokesperson? He would have to have one of these marks. Yeah, so if you're, right. yeah, if you're convicted of a sex offense against children, there's a mark on your passport that will notify the countries that you're going to. Because there's, there's problems. I mean, you go to Cambodia or Thailand, people specifically who are child molesters go to those countries because it's easy to access... Uh, what's illegal in the country that they're from. And there was a very famous, uh, I don't know the guy's name, is a f- was a famous uh, pop star who got busted in Cambodia for, for doing that. Really? Um, yeah, and so the, the moral of the story is the, 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 this is something that's, that is being proposed to be put on passports, and somebody uh, challenged it to say it's unconstitutional. Uh, two reasons, uh, saying that I have a constitutional right to travel, and this is limiting it, and I also have a constitutional right to free speech. And what they're saying is, is that because this is on my passport, it requires me to have a dialogue. So not basically, the, the First Amendment says that Congress will pass no law that abridges my right to free speech. And when the law says you have to put a, a notation or a mark on my passport, then that forces me then to say something. And part of speaking and communication is not speaking. Silence, so, silence says a lot sometimes. There, there's that uh, Dead Poet Society where... Uh, Robin Williams' character says, I want everybody to walk like you would express yourself, and one of them doesn't walk. And he says, what are you doing? And he says, I'm exercising my right not to walk, sir. So the same thing about not speaking is a form of communication, which I think the First Amendment does protect. So we're going to go ahead and take a break. So we'll finish speaking about this and that particular limitation in Scarlet Letter on passports and whether or not hindering that road to be traveled is constitutional. This is Craig Ashton, shows all things legal, and we'll see you after the break. All right, we're back. You found yourself smack dab in the middle of a show called All Things Legal. This is where curious personal injury attorneys distill topical events into their legal essence. Well, what does that mean? That means uh, in addition to uh, having a law firm at Ashton & Price where we specialize in personal injury cases and we're celebrating our 20th year, which is pretty exciting. Uh, ultimately, we're curious. So today we're distilling stories that have a legal foundational bent but really aren't developed that way within the confines of the story. And so we flesh them out a little bit for you, so hopefully improving your Jeopardy game or at least making this hour entertaining, or if not, completely vexing the individual that's sitting next to you in the car right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Out of all three branches of the government, the judicial, the executive... And the legislative, the judicial branch is probably the one that you come in contact more often in your life than any other branch of government. And so that's why you don't even realize it when you read these stories that there's some judicial underpinnings associated with it. And that's, it's fun to bring it out and, you know, discuss it so people understand what is behind it and, and how the law is affecting what they're doing and, and how the city's developing. Yeah, I totally agreed, and I think that's, I mean, I enjoy doing the show. I mean, I really do enjoy yeah. during the week reading things. Hey, you know, that'd be interesting to talk about. Let me kind of brush up a little bit on the Tenth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, mm-hmm. the First Amendment, the Sixth Amendment, et cetera. Talk about the Supremacy Clause and all those other things. And it's really, I find it very interesting, and hopefully those who are listening do as well. And like I said, if you don't, basically find the person you like least in the world and make them listen to this for an hour. There you have it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah, kind of like uh, G in there, our producer, I think he feels that way. Do you think he's, that's <laughs> what, is that why he was crying, or was it the poem? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's not like Folger's the best thing about waking up. This is for G, the worst thing about waking up. All right. 
So um, a federal judge declined on Wednesday to immediately block a law that requires a marker to be placed in passports of people convicted of sex offenses against children. And so the reason uh, the judge said, look, I'm not looking at the merits, and this is relatively standard. There's two reasons that courts basically will not look at the merits of a case. One is standing. So Ted Cruz was born in Canada, and uh, he's running for president of the United States. And there's a question as to whether or not he's a naturalized citizen or a natural-born citizen. And there's a difference. And the Constitution requires that you're naturally born. And if you are a... uh, somebody who looks at the strict construction of the Constitution as it was interpreted back in the 1700s, then the issue would really become that natural-born typically is the individual that is born inside the confines of the United States because they were worried about people not having the proper uh, connection to the country if they were born in a different country and then coming to the United States as a citizen if their parents were citizens. So... If you were looking at the fundamental understanding of it going back in the 1700s, Ted Cruz probably would not be uh, eligible to be president, but we don't interpret it quite that way at this time. So the reason nobody's heard this yet is the, the court has said that you don't have standing to challenge it. So a creative law professor, uh, I think registered, I think it's in New Jersey, to run for president of the United States, and now is challenging Ted Cruz as, a, as a not uh, constitutionally appropriate to run based upon the natural born definition. And because they're running for president, they make, can show a harm, they f- therefore they have standing. The next one is ripeness. Go ahead, Ed. No, but I mean, even even there, what was it? Goldwater was running for president. He was born in Arizona before it was a state. Mm-hmm. He was born in a territory. So I don't think this guy's got much legs to stand on, so to speak, in this matter. Yeah, so we'll, we'll see. I mean, I, I think it really kind of needs to be determined at some point because we're more of an international world, and, you know, th- this is coming up. I mean, we had uh, John McCain was actually born in, in a, uh, a base in Panama. Yeah. So I, I just think for once in a while we should decide what natural born means so we don't have to worry about the, the craziness of this and all the litigation that ultimately will ensue going forward. So that's standing. Uh, the next thing is ripeness. In other words, uh, has the case risen to a level where it becomes legally significant? And in this particular case, the, the judge said, look, right now there is no mark on the passport. So until that mark is on the passport, I'm not going to decide the merits of it. And therefore, I'm not going to uh, make a decision as to whether or not the law is unconstitutional. Yeah, because what if the law never did take effect? So the judge would be ruling on something that has no force in effect at the time that he's making a decision. So, correct, it's not ripe, it's not ready. Yeah, who, who knows what it's going to be? I mean, it, a red letter of, I, I mean, who knows? I mean, yeah. I'm not sure how, what, what designation or emoji would you put on there. An emoji? Yeah. I, w- I don't want to see that. <laughs> so, I don't know. So, it, inter- it's an interesting point. And, uh, you know, is there a constitutional right to travel internationally? And you're, you're making a good point, which is, hey, Paris is, France doesn't have to let you in. Yeah, because when I went to Paris and when I went to France, I had to get a, uh, a visa to get in there. And two... Uh, what if the country doesn't want me to come in or anybody from uh, any other country to come in without uh, a passport, et cetera? So they do put restriction on it. So by definition, it is not a fundamental right to walk I into another country. We are the number one podcast in Botswana. So if you go there, they'll actually meet you with a red carpet and uh, almost uh, is that like why that was a dignitary. I was there and that's why they rolled it out. I didn't know. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was quite exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so. Those are the issues, and you know, I, th- I think clearly there's a constitutional right to travel within the confines of the United States, and that's liberty and pursuit of happiness. Uh, but whether or not there's a constitutional right to travel to Mexico, um, especially if Donald Trump gets to be president, <laughs> they probably won't let us in. I got to go over the wall to get into Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> the beaches will be less crowded. Yeah, Donald, man, you, you weren't kidding when you said you're going to make it ten feet taller. I'm, you know, I'm an old man. I can't get over this. <laughs> It'd be kind of ironic. The only people that actually get there are going to be Canadians. So Ted Cruz will have no problem. That's right. <laughs> All right. All right. So let's go ahead and talk about now some roads. With keeping with Robert Frost, um, there is a proposal that we need to slow down on self-driving cars. Uh, there was a public meeting on self-driving cars hosted by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. And uh, there were some trade association for the automakers, as well as engineers, et cetera, that said, look, uh, you need to have a more deliberative approach than the agency's plan to roll out advice for deploying these vehicles in six months. Um, they're saying, look, 
Uh, many cars already have the automatic braking systems, so I mean that that's one argument. That, which uh, NHTSA, which is uh, NHTSA, say, look, they're already on the road. You got emergency stopping, slowing, lane changing protections, automatic emergency braking. So it's already there. So you know, chill. Versus other people saying, look, here's the thing. Um, right now we have poorly marked pavement, uh, including parking lots and driveways. If it's raining or snowing, this technology doesn't work. Uh, Self-driving cars can't take directions from police officers. There's inconsistent traffic control devices like horizontal versus vertical. Because the ones that are pushing it are Google and General Motors are saying, look, we're going. And Google wants no steering wheel, no brakes, right? When I grew up, I grew up down in the Orange County, L.A. area. And it seemed like every morning on the news there was a high-speed chase. The police were chasing somebody. So now it'll be interesting waking up and watching them chase in a self-driving car going, you know, 20 miles an hour down the freeway and then put a pick maneuver on it to put it into the curb. <laughs> so should ha we should have some good fun with this, folks. <laughs> yeah. So the, the idea is, is that uh, General Motors is, is moving forward very quickly and then uh, Google – and so Google wants to move forward, and they, they want it to be fully self-driving, really without in, anybody operating the vehicle. California has already had proposed rules with the DMV that says, look, we're going in the self-driving direction, but we need a steering wheel and brakes. And the person, we need an operator behind the wheel that can take over right away. And if there is an accident, it's going to be the driver, not the manufacturer, that's going to be responsible. And this is actually where the law comes into place for, like, seat belts, all these other safety mechanisms you get in vehicles – are because of personal injury attorneys that bring these up. So they put these cars out here, and you start having accidents. They're going to be challenged in court. It's going to be vetted through the legal process. And you can thank, you know, your lucky stars. You have attorneys doing this. It'll make this more safer for you out on the road. So it's actually, it'll be interesting. I mean, they'll do everything they can to avoid all of that, but there's always some gap somewhere, like on a rainy day, and the car just can't follow or take direction the way it's supposed to against a badly marked road it's going to be interesting so they're going to have to there's going to be a lot of infrastructure etc that goes into place to make this as safe as possible otherwise we will have to vet it through the court system say hey this is where you failed this is what you should have done yeah the, the sort of damocles that hangs over most business decisions are financial ones so when it comes down to a civil penalty for not doing something that's less expensive, in other words, a three-point harness versus a lap belt, a, a stronger A-pillar, which is part of the uh, engineering of a vehicle that helps in a rollover from you ended up ending up dead, head injury, or a quadriplegic. Airbags. Airbags. Yeah. Uh, basically, all of those things uh, came into effect as a result of a business decision that the manufacturers made as a result of individuals through their plaintiff's lawyers exercising their rights through our civil system under strict products liability and the law of negligence. And those are pushes and pulls that have allowed us to kind of get to a point where cars are much safer. And we're going to talk about that in a second regarding the speed limits. And traffic deaths have gone down by over 10,000 in the last decade from 93 to 2013. And we'll talk about how some of the safety measures of the vehicles are responsible for that. So uh, the idea is, is that um, with the issues pertaining to the financial penalty to not having a safer car, the manufacturer said, hey, look, it costs us five bucks per car to put in a three-point harness versus a lap belt. One of the first cases I took as an attorney, I, I just got out of law school, and I was watching uh, 60 Minutes, and I saw a case about the lap belts. And I was working for the offices of Arnold Laub in San Francisco, and a, a guy came to me and said, look, another law firm has settled my case for $15,000 said, there's no, nothing else I can do. I'm paralyzed, and, and I would like somebody else to look at it. And fortunately for me, I was a young attorney who basically didn't know any better. And I talked to uh, the head lawyer in our law firm in San Francisco. He said, ah, state of the art is a total defense. The car's too old. Uh, there's no cause of action. I said, would you, would you mind if I went out and talked to some people that are experts on this and, and see if I can find a better avenue for this individual? Because guess what? He wants a magic wand so he can walk again. But his life will be a lot better if he gets really good medical care and he basically has a nice place to live in, in, a, in, a, in a car that is, is, is manufactured and engineered for him to drive because he can't use his legs. So I interviewed three different lawyers, and I ended up uh, with Craig McClellan, who is the expert on lap belt cases and had a large jury verdict against, I think it was um, Ford. And ultimately, the engineering was that lap belts focus all the energy to the middle part uh, or the lower part of the uh, abdomen and onto the spine. 
And then head-on accidents or, or accidents that were front, frontal force, either rear end collision or hitting a, a movable object, the forces are focused on the abdomen and causing paralysis in many cases. In the case that I had, uh, the you know, the client wasn't beaver cleaver. Was, they're more like beavers and butthead types. They were, you know, they're young and having fun, right? And, you know, there was some marijuana involved and, and you know, it had nothing to do with the injury sustained, but the type of thing that defendants, especially large car manufacturers, tend to amplify. And the thing that was helpful is the passenger was not wearing a seatbelt and had a broken foot. The driver was wearing a three-point harness and had a broken collarbone. My client in the rear seat uh, was wearing a lap belt and was paralyzed from the waist down. So as a result of using the uh, law, which is strict products liability, and the ideas about the manufacturer could have spent 50 bucks on each car to put in a three-point harness but kept a, a lap belt, we prevailed. And I was able, as a new attorney, I only had six months' experience working with one of the best personal injury attorneys in the country when it comes to lap belt cases in Craig McClellan. Our client received millions of dollars, which helped him kind of ameliorate some of the challenges that were associated with basically being in your 20s and, and not being able to walk. So, he, you know, the, the, the cool moment for me was, you know, him thanking me for taking the case and moving forward. I learned a lot about products liability, and that was over you know, 23 years ago that I did that case. And so the idea is, is that now you don't see lap belts in cars anymore, and one of the reasons is they've paid out a lot of money on those cases because they really are more dangerous than a reasonable consumer would expect. So anyway, that, that's, that, that was a point that we're trying to make. So we're about ready to take a break. Uh, when we come back, we'll go ahead and talk about the Supremacy Clause, federal law that was changed in 1995. And guess what? Now states are free to uh, increase the speed limits as high as they want to go. And we'll talk about that and the impact on uh, safety. And we'll do that after the break. This is Craig Ashton. The show is all things legal. Check it out. It's all things legal with Craig Ashton from the law firm of Ashton and Price on Money 105.5. All right, we're back. This is All Things Legal. My name is Craig Ashton. This is Money 105.5, the Wall Street Business Network. If you've never listened to the show before, this is where curious personal injury attorneys distill topical events into their legal essence. Today is no different. I'm joined by my colleague, Bon Vivant, uh, Renaissance man, uh, unbelievably great trial lawyer, Edward Shady. Good morning, Sacramento. And uh, Ed, you were just out uh, with your lovely wife, Denise, who uh, I take her advice seriously. <laughs> <laughs> who uh, is a very young-looking, uh, so young-looking, sometimes they mistake her for uh, your, your daughter. Yeah, which is nice. <laughs> <laughs> Even though she's uh, almost your age, which is 38. Yeah. <laughs> 28, whatever the age is. Um, I don't want to get myself into trouble here. So uh, you Stay away you, from that landmine. You, you, you visited your, your son, who's in ROTC at Oklahoma State is going to, when he graduates, going to go into the military as a lieutenant, right? Correct. You're going to the uh, butter bars. Uh, what do they call Second lieutenant because they're, uh, the bars are gold. That's nice. Yeah. So, yeah, and pretty exciting. I mean, I, you know, I remember picking your son up uh, at, uh, what is it, St. Joe's, St. John's? St. John's Notre Dame. And then uh, you had the unfortunate experience of driving into the car line the wrong <laughs> direction, I believe. <laughs> yeah. got but chastised. I, I think at that time <laughs> I had a convertible Porsche Carrera with uh, pulling into the uh, Catholic school because I don't I don't have any children so I don't know really how this works going in the wrong way people honking at me but uh, it all worked out fine yeah it did <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny <laughs> so um, basically before we took the break we started uh, speaking about a new law in Pennsylvania which essentially they're raising the speed limit there uh, per the Department of Tran Transportation in Pennsylvania up to 70 miles an hour and the reason that's germane to what we're speaking of is that there's a supremacy clause, which basically says federal law supersedes state law. So if there is an inconsistency between federal and state law, federal law applies. So in 1995, the national maximum speed limit was changed by Congress and removed from 65, and then was left up to the states to increase the speed limit. So what we're seeing now, which is kind of interesting, is that back then, if, if California said, no, we're going 75, and you made a really good point, Ed, Basically, the federal government would cut, cut off your transportation funds. That's right. They, they, that was their, uh, their leverage. If you didn't follow their rules and regulations, then they would – well, this has actually come into play in other ways, too. I think it was 1985, like in the state of Hawaii. Uh, at 84, you could go to Hawaii, and 18 years old, you could buy you know, beer, wine, etc. And then it became 21 because the federal government would start withholding 
funds if you didn't bring everything up to the age of 21. So the state didn't do it out of their own, the goodness of their own heart. They did it because of monetary reasons. It, so, it, 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 it's, it's interesting because it, it wasn't yeah. really litigated. It was just the threat of uh, the money, money, which basically caused the law to change. Correct. You know, it, it's the carrot and the stick. I'm going to give you a carrot of billions of dollars of highway funds, but if you don't follow this, I'm going to give you the stick by taking these funds away. Because we're, we're seeing this right now, and I was trying to think about another example, and this actually prompted me to, yeah. to understand that this is a pretty good one, that we have Colorado, Washington, the District of Columbia, so where Washington, D.C. is. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I think Alaska, uh, and then Oregon, Colorado, have all basically made uh, marijuana legal for recreational use. And it's legal in California for medical use, which is a violation of federal law, which ultimately marijuana is considered a class one drug, which is basically the most dangerous drug there is. And you're looking at life in prison for federal violations for relatively minor infractions, at least from a state level. And the reason the states are doing it at this point is because there really isn't no financial sort of Damocles that's hanging over the head of Colorado or California or or Washington or Oregon at this point, like the transportation funds, because fixing the roads is a big deal. And if you got a bunch of potholes, people start to complain. And guess guess what? You don't get elected to your was there assembly a pun in, seat. Was that a pun? Potholes and pot. <laughs> <laughs> so that that was a super good point. And so now we're seeing the dynamic of all the the states, many states, and California. I think on the on the ballot in November, it's going to be up for a vote as to whether or not. Uh, ultimately, we're going to, as a state, determine that marijuana can be used recreationally without penalty, uh, except for just like if you're, you have to be over 21, you can't drive a vehicle. It, it, think of it this way. It's, as long as you don't infringe on the individual line of self-interest and, and, and infringe on the inside of that for somebody else, and you can smoke marijuana. So smoke it at home. Don't get behind the wheel. Don't get on your bicycle. Don't get on your skateboard. And, you know, be responsible, don't hurt yourself, and, and you can do that. That's, that's what's probably going to happen in November. But that's a violation of federal law. And so if the federal government wanted to come in, they could arrest all the people that are selling it, they could arrest all the people that are using it, and then apply the federal guidelines, and the penalties are pretty stiff. It, it, it gets even you know, more abstract under the law because if the state legislature or even your county officials now pass a law and say, hey, we're going to allow uh, medicinal marijuana – uh, what do they call it when you, it's like a pharmacy, but it's not a pharmacy. It's uh, uh, what well, they sell it. And by doing that, since it's federally illegal, but now you're pairing up with a private business to sell something that's federally illegal, you're actually entering into a conspiracy. Mm -hmm. It's called, called a dispensary. A dispensary. So, you know, federally, you're, you know, your local lawmaker that's allowing the dispensary and the person running the dispensary are actually in concert with each other and part of a conspiracy. So... It gets really strange under federal law, but it's not enforced because there's nothing the federal government can do about it financially to the state. The states are pretty much putting their the thumb right in the federal government's side and say, we're going to do whatever we want because there's no money here for you to take away from us like you could with the uh, Department of Transportation and federal highway funds. It, it's, there's kind of an unusual dichotomy that's in place at this point from a political perspective, which is the Democrats are pretty laissez-faire on social issues, right? Um, they, they're more or less women's right to choose, uh, federal government ought to stay out of your, th those decisions. Uh, basically, when it comes to social issues, they're much broader in terms of what they feel is appropriate and the government should be out of those decisions. And then the Republicans are all about states' rights. And so they're saying, look, the states ought to decide almost all these issues. So those two particular lines of reasoning bifurcate. And at the meeting point, they're both on the same side. And so that would tend to inure in the direction that there isn't going to be an enforcement of federal law no matter who gets elected president. But I think it's less likely if it's a Democrat than a Republican in regards to what's happening in Colorado, Washington, et cetera, under the supremacy clause. I mean, to me, it's like prohibition back in the 20s. You're much better off regulating it and taxing it than you are calling it an illegal substance where you cannot regulate it and you don't know what's going on. It's much better to put it out in the open and therefore you have more control of what's going on. In India years ago, uh, bribery was a real significant problem until they basically made most of it legal. And now it happens less often because it's out in the open. So when you shine the light of day on behavior, uh, bad behavior tends to be curtailed. And because there, there's no profit motive and the benefits of bribery when it's everybody can do it, it's open to everyone, not just um, individuals that are willing to break the law. So anyway, let's, let's talk about the, the speed limits. So basically what I thought was interesting, the Insurance Institute of Highway Safety 
uh, which is basically funded by the insurance industry, said that raising the speed limit actually, even though we have less deaths, so in 1993, there were 40,868 traffic deaths. In 2013, there were only 32,000. When we say only, that's a lot. I yeah. think that's about the same amount of people that died in Vietnam. So the, the moral of the story is, is that lots of people die, but they're less. And what they're saying is that this, would be, this number would be even lower if the speed limit was not 65 and not, not have been raised or even 70, 85. And what they're saying is, it be, what they're saying is that you know, if it's 65, people are going to go 75. I just don't think you can factor those things in. That's a statistic, but you know, that's more uh, anecdotal. It's more hyperbolic. What? It's it, it, not based upon a foundational scientific understanding. You were talking about better medical care. Well, yeah, because there's so many variables you have to take into place. Where they said, oh, we look, you know, we increased the speed limit, or we reduced it to 65, and deaths went down from 93 to 2013. But at the same time that deaths were going down, you also had better health care. You had better emergency room services. You had better first responders. You had Life Flight. You have Jaws of Life. You have all these other things that are coming into play, which would also bring down the death rate in any automobile accident. So how can you say that it's the speed and not necessarily all the other factors that are surrounding, you know, safer cars, et cetera, that did this? And if we could amalgamate all the stories here, uh, if we have a driverless car Ooh. and it's a Ferrari. It's doing 85. <laughs> can, can it do 200? <laughs> because there shouldn't be a speed limit, right? Correct. And so under that scenario, so... Basically, these are all themes that had to do with the road less traveled or the road traveled, the road less taken. We talked about Major League Soccer coming to Sacramento. We talked about Kaiser making another massive investment. We talked about driverless cars. We talked about uh, speed limits, the supremacy clause, and we talked about traveling with a passport and uh, basically putting a scarlet letter on that passport if you're a convicted child sex offender. Hopefully you found that interesting. Hopefully you found that informative. And if you didn't, make sure you make one of your friends listen to the show tonight between 6 and 7. On this channel, we'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us. You've been listening to the All Things Legal Show with your host, Craig Ashton, on 105.5 KSAC. For more information, go to ashtonandprice.com, see them on Facebook, or call 916-786-7787. Remember, for the best advice, don't think twice. Call 